Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Schwarz in the Department of Surgery at Columbia University Medical Center and New York Presbyterian Hospital. Welcome to our Blog Talk Radio show with Dr. Tomo Aki, the Chief of the Division of Abdominal Organ Transplantation, and Dr. Anthony Watkins, Assistant Professor of Surgery in the Department of Transplantation. Today, we are going to chat with these two stars of New York Med to find out what it's like to practice medicine for years and then one day have a camera crew following your every move. Both Dr. Cato and Dr. Watkins are practicing physicians at the Center for Liver Disease and Abdominal Organ Transplantation at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Cameras followed both doctors and their patients as they went through the arduous and sometimes frustrating process of transplantation and surgery. The show has become a platform to highlight awareness of the organ donation shortage and how it affects so many patients waiting for transplant. Feel free to call into our show live at 347-539-5189. Again, 347-539-5189. Or send us a question via Twitter using the hashtag pound NYMed as we are taking live questions for the doctors today. We encourage you to ask them about their time on the show, their day-to-day work life, as well as the serious barriers that transplantation currently faces. We will try to answer as many questions as we can within the next 30 minutes. Welcome, Dr. Cato and Dr. Watkins. We are so glad to have you both here as part of the Blog Talk Talk Radio Show. Can you please state your name and title and say a little bit about yourself, starting with Dr. Cato. Hi, my name is Tomoaki Kato. I'm a professor of surgery, chief um, abdominal organ transplant division. Um, I'm a transplant surgeon. I do mostly liver transplant and uh, a small bowel transplant, and also do uh, some um, uh, advanced uh, surgery called ex vivo surgery. I took organ tumor out and cut the tumor and organs back in. Uh, but I also do a, a more of a standard uh, liver resection, uh, pancreas resection, and that kind of oncological surgery as well. And I am Dr. Anthony Watkins. I'm Assistant Professor of Surgery in the Department of Surgery and Division of Transplant. I trained under the guidance of Dr. Cato as, as a fellow at Columbia for two years and then stayed on as an assistant professor. I primarily uh, do kidney pancreas transplantation as well as general surgery and vascular access procedures. Thank you very much. So our first question is actually from Facebook, and it's for both Dr. Cato and Dr. Watkins. First, Dr. Cato, I'll read the question. What was the scariest part about being filmed and watching yourself on television? And secondly, how was your life and job changed since the show has premiered? Well, you know, um, I, I I don't know. I hope I don't have much uh, coming yet. But uh, um, if this is something that uh, we are caught on camera uh, unknowingly and it's going to go appear on a TV, um, I heard that, that that already happened to Dr. Watkins. That could have been very could have been very secure, scary. Um, but I think, and overall, it is uh, um, really. What we do in daily um, are really on the show. Uh, so um, I think uh, this is uh, really a great reflection of our uh, um, the profession uh, to the viewer. Um, so um, in a way, I, I don't think anything changed before and after uh, being on a show uh, to my practice uh, at all. Um, you know, the, some of the moment that was shown on the episode was not necessarily my favorite moment. <laughs> But including all the moment, I really love my profession, and um, that hasn't really changed at all. Thank you. And Dr. Watkins? Uh, yeah, I think the the, the most nerve-wracking aspect for scariest moments were just getting accustomed to, to having a camera follow you uh, 24-7, so to speak. Um, you know, I think that was really just the initial aspect of the process, but once you got accustomed to the camera, um, you almost forgot it was there um, most of the time. I think that for me, you know, I've only had a small segment of the show thus far, so as far as feeling the effects... Uh, I think, you know, people around the hospital, you know, just say, oh, I saw you last night on TV. But for myself and Dr. Cato, I think our our primary or, or better cases are yet to come on the on the show. And I think you the viewers will be able to see us do some, some great things in liver transplant as well as ex vivo cases. Excellent. 
Nicholas, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Cato. Several people have asked about Cornelius, the liver cancer patient in the first episode. Would a liver transplant have cured Cornelius? What were his options at that point in the show? Yeah, this is a very good question. So the liver transplant has been offered and used to treat specific type of liver cancer, but not the type uh, Mr. Cornelius has. Uh, there's a two different type of liver cancer. One is called hepatocellular calcinoma, uh, hepatocellular cancer. The other one is called cholangiocellular cancer, cholangiocellular calcinoma. Uh, Mr. Cornelius Brett has cholangiocellular cancer. The use of liver transplantation on the cholangiocellular cancer has been very, very limited. Um, on the other hand, though, hepatocellular cancer, which is a lot more common type of liver cancer, the liver transplant has been uh, one of the main um, uh, treatment for it. Uh, so it depends on the type of the liver cancer. Uh, liver transplant can be offered to a patient with liver cancer, but not in, this, in, in his case. Mm-hmm. Okay. And did he have any other options at that point? Yeah, you know, there's there's still many um, options, uh, including uh, chemo or other things called chemoembolization, which the treatment he went back in Boston and had, um, it had a great response. So in that way, uh, there were some options, um, but I guess I would say that the the, uh, um, the curative option um, could have been a surgery at that point. Thank you. Well, this question is yeah, from Mary Lou W. for Dr. Watkins. Dr. Watkins, how did yes, you hello. choose how are you doing? as a career choice? I read that you came you? from a family okay. of doctors. Did your family's experience in medicine encourage or affect your field of study? Um, I uh, I do come from a family of doctors. Ironically, my grandfather was a, is a cardiothoracic surgeon, but okay. wow. due to various uh, family dynamics, I did not meet him until I was a junior in college. So I really, you know, think that medicine in my family is is something that's a, a genetic base. I recently traced my my family tree and realized that one of my third great grandmothers was a midwife and was heavily heavily involved in in uh health care you know at that time so we we were sitting around talking and we we tend to think that it might be something that's just you know uh built into our genes but i always wanted to be a, a physician uh, as long as i can remember actually um it's just because i was fascinated with science and I always liked uh, working with people and helping others so you know, being a transplant surgeon was was uh was an easy career choice because it was uh, a way for me to merge those two desires or interests that I had in life and and, and make medicine uh, something that I pursued. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Cato, um, this question's from Twitter. John Kuhlfeld from the second episode waited for eight months for a liver transplant. What is the normal waiting time for liver to be, for a liver to become available, and how does the liver donation and transplantation process actually work? Well, so um, the liver transplant waiting time is really depends on how sick you are. Uh, the, right now, the current system uh, prioritizing the patient um, the, you know, depends on the sickness. Uh, we uh, uh, assign the score from uh, 0 to 40, and 40 being the highest. So the highest score patient uh, transplant usually happen within uh, uh, week to two. Um, but those are the patients who is not expected to live that long. Um, so um, the sicker you are, um, the sicker you are, you really definitely get uh, the transfer very quickly and fast. Great, thank you. Know, is there something calling you? I'm sorry, the, um, a phone is ringing. Please excuse the noise. Yeah, it's oh, this is a problem. Okay, sorry about that. It's finished. Uh, All right. Okay. Next, I'm sorry. Were you finished or no? Oh no, no. no. Oh. <laughs> so, so the at the time that the lower score uh, patients uh, a lot longer than that. Sometimes it's uh, far exceeding a uh, year uh, in certain patients. Uh, but the patient expected to wait a little longer. Um, um, the uh, uh, liver transplant um, 
um, the uh, donation, uh, organ donation, uh, whoever uh, the family sign for organ donation for their uh, family uh, who after they passed, um, they can have a significant impact uh, on the liver waiting time. Um, so it depends on where you live. Certain area, there's more donor than the recipient waiting, and the waiting time is much quicker. And in some areas, there's more recipient, but not enough donor number of donor uh, sign consent for a donation. Uh, these area can get really slow, uh, and uh, waiting time can be really long. Okay, great. We actually have a live caller. Um, uh, a question from Rue. Are you there? Rue. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Now we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi. How are you doing, doctors? Good, good. How are you? Good. I'm thrilled that you're there for us. Um, I had a question regarding cirrhosis of the liver. I'm in uh, Delaware, and I have an excellent GI, and I have a hepatologist in Pennsylvania, and I have cirrhosis of the liver. When I was, I'm 49. When I was diagnosed, I was told in a very crass manner, I thought, and I wondered what the most important point you all would make in telling someone, a patient sitting in front of you, that they have full-blown cirrhosis, because as it was told to me, it was as if a casual remark, no no brochure handed to me, no idea of where to go. I was in total shock, thinking I was dying. And I wondered how you would approach that in sitting the patient down and telling them such news when they think it's a death sentence and it doesn't have to be. Well, maybe maybe I'll answer the question um, because it's part of my daily work uh, to... Uh, notify a patient about uh, their disease, and in particular, the liver disease. Um, but, you know, the most patient comes to us is already have that cirrhosis uh, award given to the patient, uh, but I can probably give some um, equivalent of more advanced stage, um, how serious it is. Um, you know, I can understand that um, how you speak to the patient has an impact on that. Um, but I guess, you know, uh, withholding information is never helped, so you really have to be upfront with it. Um, but in a cirrhosis, there's a big range between the earlier cirrhosis to the advanced cirrhosis. Um, mm-hmm. Some patients can be cirrhotic for years with no problem. And that would be um, as class A, the, the compensated? Yeah, you know, in a way, yes. It's not always the class A, B, C is the only way to grade okay. cirrhosis degree. Um, but yes, um, the cr- class A, the child A cirrhosis is the well compensated stage, and a well compensated stage does not necessarily have to have any treatment. Um, and of course, depends on what you have. Um, the cause of cirrhosis. Some of the cause of cirrhosis is progressive, meaning that it goes get worse over time. And in that type of cirrhosis, uh, you really have to watch carefully. Um, and also, sometimes, you know, cirrhosis can be found in a almost end stage too. Um, so some patients don't notice uh, while they were in a well-compensated early cirrhosis and only found to have the diagnosis very late in the picture. Um, so there's a wide range, first of all, and then uh, probably uh, what the doctor uh, wasn't really, um, you know, um, explaining too much and then just uh, give you the word cirrhosis was probably your cirrhosis at that time was uh, really an early stage, wasn't it? Not really. Um, I have alcohol-induced cirrhosis, and it looks like I caught it early. My my CPT is 7 right now, and my MELD is 10. Um, I've been through a transplant evaluation, okay. and the, the the thing he basically said was, you have cirrhosis and you need a transplant or you'll die. Okay. And, of course, at transplant and a year later, I'm pretty much as healthy as you can be with cirrhosis and very fortunate that it's alcohol-induced and not autoimmune. Right, right. Um, yeah. So, so I'm, that's, I'm uh, right. that's one better. point, right. That's a, that's a, another good point that you know, alcohol is one. There's still some reversible component on it. 
you know, we've seen the patient coming in really sick, but after they stop drinking for a while, the things can get better and some patients can get away, don't have to have a transplant. Um, so if that's the direction of yours, that's, that's really great. Um, Isn't that incredible? Yes. Be. Um, maybe a chance. I think uh, the MELT score 10 uh, and the CPT7, I think the MELT score 10 and, and uh, alcohol disease, it sounds, uh, it sounds very stable right now. Yes, I, I've only had ascites once and um, I have mild HE or either that or it's an alcoholic, just uh, dam- some, some minor damage from the alcohol. Um, and uh, some severe nosebleeds, but they stopped, and my platelets are good, and I've, good, I belong good, to a, a, a liver site, that uh, MD Junction, that is just awesome and has taught me so much. And at my transplant evaluation, the surgeon looked at me and said, by all accounts, I see no reason you're ever going to need a transplant mm-hmm. if you keep doing what you're doing. Good, good. But That's I, Yes, and I'm I'm so blessed, and I I pray for those who aren't as blessed. But I did quit drinking, and I did you know take charge, and start exercising and eating right and getting healthy. And you know so I'm many sorry to are so scared. Me. Move on to the next question. But thank you well, very much for calling in. Thank really. you for your time, doctors. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is from Jenny H. for Dr. Watkins. Have you performed or do you know of successful pancreas transplants? If so, what criteria would make a good candidate to receive a pancreas transplant? Okay, so uh, I do perform pancreas transplants. Uh, we do both uh, simultaneous pancreas kidney transplants. Uh, pancreas after kidney transplants or in rare cases we do pancreas alone transplants. Uh, the, the ideal candidate for a pancreas transplant is number one is someone who's had uh, diabetes um, affect their kidneys and need a kidney transplant and the idea here is that you know even though you can get a kidney transplant with a patient still having diabetes the new kidney is at risk for damage to the kidney from the persistent diabetes so these patients uh, present you know optimal candidates for what we call a uh, either a simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant or they get a kidney transplant from a living donor and then subsequently get a a pancreas transplant from a deceased donor now, also, there's a subset of patients who have very difficult to, to control diabetes. Uh, the sugars are remain extremely elevated despite insulin and other uh, medications. Um, or patients who get hypoglycemic and they're unaware of this, which can be a, a very life-threatening illness. These patients, these two subsets also represent candidates for a pancreas transplant, even if they do not have kidney disease because the benefits, you know, of the pancreas transplant um, outweigh the risk associated with the surgery. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before we go on to the next question, I just want to remind our listeners who just tuned in uh, that if you have a question and would like to call in live, please call 347-539-5189. That's 347-539-5189. Or you can uh, go through Twitter and use the hashtag pound New York Med. So on to the next question. This one is from Chad I. for Dr. Watkins again. What are some of the reasons people give for not wanting to donate their organs? Are these reasons valid? Do you think initiatives like the Facebook Organ Drive can change people's perceptions and increase the number of donations? Yes, uh, so there's there's multiple reasons why people do not give, and I think a large portion of of, of patients or potential donors are just a lack of knowledge. I think there's you know a lot of people who do don't understand the long term uh, risk that they do or do not have if they, for example, are kidney donors. So there's a lot of unknown information that exists in the population that if if we as a healthcare industry and as physicians, you know, could continue to to do what we can to educate that people will realize that they can do perfectly well with a single kidney and have normal life expectancy and don't run a higher risk of kidney failure because of that. Other reasons include uh, certain religious um, uh, beliefs that donating an organ is, is against their beliefs, but there are cases where, um, you know, it is, it is, people are able to donate their, you know, organs despite what they think their, you know, traditional religion might contradict. 
Um, otherwise, um, I think, you know, initiatives such as what Facebook did is, is very good for, um, you know, the organ transplant community. I think that with tools such as these, we can increase the knowledge. Uh, we can increase awareness of the importance of organ donation. And, and, and with shows such as New York Med, I think what people will really be able to do is see the benefit that, that occurs when someone is on the brink of death or or in dire need of an organ, and you see the, the way that their life is their lives are changed drastically, you know, after organ transplantation. So, you know, to recap, I think there's multiple reasons. There's there's a lack of knowledge. There's certain relig religious, um, you know, issues, and then there's certain, you know, just fears of the unknown. But again, through through things such as Facebook, through um, celebrities who who are in need of transplant and get transplanted, you know, their exposure uh, and things such as New York Med, I think we have a lot of the tools coming to, coming into play that. And, you know, fortunately, you know, increase the knowledge and in the future, hopefully increase organ donation. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, we have a live caller. Ray, are you there? Ray, are you on the line? Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, now we can. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say uh, I just celebrated my second birthday. Uh, I had a liver transplant done by Dr. Cato two years ago. Congratulations. And I had a party with a little candle. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually have uh, two questions. One is uh, my father also passed away from cirrhosis uh, 35, 40 years ago, but he had alcoholic cirrhosis, and I had non-alcoholic cirrhosis. And at the time, I guess I was told in discussion that it, you really don't uh, – I uh, think that cirrhosis is a genetic disease. Is that still the case, and has there been any additional studies on that? Well, um, there's some cases of a uh, genetic uh, or congenital, some hereditary cirrhosis that happens, but that's very rare. Alcohol is clearly not the one. Uh, Non-alcohol cirrhosis-wise, is there any genetic predisposing condition to the non-alcoholic cirrhosis, um, the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, I'm sorry, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis? There may be, but at least there's no um, well-known identified factor uh, in that either. Uh, but some of the diabetes tendency may predispose more towards those uh, conditions. Um, so there's something might be the genetic background plus um, alcohol or plus something. So that might be some, you know, relation and uh, accumulation in the family. Uh, but it's uh, most of the cirrhosis causes, as far as we know, except for some of the uncertain, unknown, well-known, not well-known um, causes, are not really hereditary. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Cato. Thank you for um, me be still being alive. I really appreciate what you Thank said. you. Thank you, and thanks for calling in, and uh, you're welcome. Right. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, welcome. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, right now, our next question uh, came in via email for Dr. Cato, and the question is, are you a surgical innovator operating on conditions and situations that are unique and rare, and how do you prepare for something that's never been done before? Oh, well, that's a good question too. So, um, you know, the, most of the time, though, even that's the first time, the component of the process um, we do a lot prior to doing the first one. Um, maybe something similar to, um, like, um, climbing the Mount Everest for the first time, or the sending the human to the moon. You know, the process of climbing. Um, a lot of people have done it. Um, equipment used for climbing, um, and then climbing in certain area, certain height. Or the same thing applied to the spaceship to go, you know, out of the uh, uh, Earth's uh, um, atmosphere. Uh, some people have done prior to sending the uh, people to the moon. Um, so, you know, there's something similar to um, the surgeries that I do as the first time because, you know, I do took all the organs out and uh, put, um, cut the tumor and put the organs back in. For me to do the 
entire abdominal organ are the first time, but you know, the component of surgery, like doing a liver transplant, uh, doing uh, intestinal transplant, I do parts of those um, surgery already and many, many times, and also suturing technique, uh, preservation solution technique, you know, all these are the things that are already known. But on the other hand, the same thing apply uh, to the uh, um, the climbing the highest mount in the world or the um, sending the people to the moon for the first time is that there's always something uncertain and unknown may ahead of you. Um, so that's the thing that um, we really have to prepare for it. Um, so when I first did entire abdominal ex vivo, meaning I took all the organs out, including stomach, pancreas, liver, spleen, intestine, and everything. Um, for that particular patient had a tumor right on the abdominal aorta, I even asked the cardiothoracic surgeon to stand by for cardiopulmonary bypass in case something goes wrong and excessive bleeding, we can cool down and slow down the heart. Um, and also did some other preparation for a child who was going for the similar surgery that I wasn't sure that if you're able to fix the liver and put back in, I asked the father to stand by for a liver donor. It also take a lot of time and long time before we commit ourselves, burn the bridge to back out so we can always back off if necessarily. Um, so so these are uh, the steps and the preparation, um, but there's still some unknown ahead that uh, um, makes it very difficult, um, but also in a way exciting. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is again for Dr. Kato from an anonymous, anonymous person. Your career started in Japan. I understand that the organ donation and transplant process in Japan is limited when compared to ours in the United States. Why is this, and are the restrictions and laws in Japan changing to be more like ours? Yes. So, um, the uh, beginning of uh, probably the Japanese culture is somewhat um, not necessary to go along with the idea of organ donation, but I don't think that's the major reason Japan went so behind in organ transplant. There was some unfortunate instance a long time ago in 1960s when they tried to do the first heart transplant. The heart transplant patient died after transplant. It was found that uh, the donor may not have been completely dead when the organs were taken, or the uh, heart recipient may not even need the heart transplant. Um, that suspicion uh, allegation um, made a public into a huge uh, issue of uh, uh, mistrust to the organ transplant surgeon and organ transplant idea itself. Um, that set them back for almost 30 years with no organ transplant from cadaver donor. Um, then they just started a very, very uh, strict role to do organ transplant. It's about uh, um, 15 years ago and then revised the law um, just a few years ago for a much more uh, modern, um, similar to the U.S. type law. So they're just starting. Uh, hopefully, um, they will pick up um, more. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Watkins, the next uh, question came in via Twitter. In the third episode of New York Med, one of the heart transplant recipients was HIV positive. Can an HIV positive patient have a liver or kidney transplant, and is this something that New York Presbyterian will perform? Oh, yeah. So, you know, in this day and age, HIV patients um, do very well. Uh, you know, when, when HIV was first recognized as a serious health concern, you know, there was it was almost considered a death sentence. But what's happened is the advancements in medicine have, have really revolutionized the way we treat the patients and the way we view them. So, at one point, it was a relative contraindication for transplantation, but in this day and age, we do transplant HIV patients uh, with kidneys and livers. This is not a, a contraindication. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cato, Marlene D. has uh, asked a question of you. She says, I read that you perform intestinal transplants. When would someone need an intestinal transplant, and what is the process? So the typical patient who need intestinal transplant, in, for some reason, uh, they lost intestine. And the children, a lot of time, are a congenital problem. 
something that child born with, some child born with very, very short bowel, or somebody uh, born with something that the bowel doesn't function, or um, some cases that there's a, some anomaly called uh, malrotation of bowel that's more likely to twist the bowel. So when they twist the bowel, uh, they're likely to lose uh, more lengths of bowel and end up becoming short in a bowel. So that if the bowel is too short, you cannot absorb nutrients by uh, oral intake. That's when the transplant is needed. In adult cases of intestinal transplant, a lot of times these are uh, trauma or the vascular uh, incidents such as the blood vessel somehow clotted after the surgery or some other problem of the um, abnormality of a coagulation um, then end up uh, losing the bowel but primary cause is a short gut. And some very unusual indication, uh, some of the tumor called desmoid tumor, it's a large tumor, tend to uh, grow on the inside of the mesentery of the bowel um, that can be a indication for a bowel transplant, mostly in adult cases. Hey, thank you very much. Dr. Watkins, Joey B. asks, how did your family adapt to being on television? What was it like going on vacation with the ABC crew? <laughs> uh, that was actually quite interesting because it was, it was very unexpected. I um, happened to go to St. Thomas with my family during uh, the time that they were here filming. Uh, but there was really no plan for them to join us. And ironically, I was meeting my mother uh, there, uh, which was a perfect vacation for me to spend with not only my wife and kids, but also my mother. But when I got off the plane, um, the producer called me, uh, Mr. Wrong, and uh, you know, asked if he didn't mind if I, if I would mind sending the cameraman down. And, you know, what happened with this process, you know, I was filmed by one guy throughout the entire duration of uh, the time that they were here and we really became great friends I mean, you know so when he asked me to send a cameraman I really didn't mind because I thought actually it would be good for the cameraman to be able to come down and get some sun and beach so uh, it actually worked out pretty well uh, my mother got a chance to be interviewed so she uh, was excited about that and we actually went to a beach and uh, while I was getting filmed and while when we were leaving, a lady walked up to me and, and asked me if I was Denzel Washington and I thought that was uh, kind of funny. But it, overall, it was a great experience. Um, we had a we had a good time with the cameraman. I think uh, he got a chance to see, you know, how we like to work hard but also play hard and how, you know, our, our respective families are important to us and we like to spend that time with them as well when we can. Great. Thank you. Sounds like fun. So we're going to close our program for the day. Dr. Cato and Dr. Watkins, thank you very much for your time. We hope that our listeners have been able uh, to uh, have their questions answered if they called in, or uh, you can still email them to us, and we will have the doctors answer your questions by email. If you would like more information on the Center for Liver Disease and Abdominal Organ Transplantation, you can visit our website at www.livermd.org. That's w www.livermd.org or call 212-305-0914. And as a reminder, our next show will be on September 5th at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time and we'll be speaking with Dr. Feldman once again about what you need to know uh, if you have been diagnosed with advanced stage breast cancer. Thank you for tuning in and have a very healthy day. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather. 